Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Label Calculations. This information comes directly from the North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. And guys, pesticides, there's nothing sexy about it, there's nothing uh, exciting about it, but I think you're going to like this course because we threw some cool graphics in here and then we're going to talk about pricing our pesticides um, and comparing it to pricing our beer. So it's a little fun exercise at the end. So guys, I hope you'll enjoy it. And I thank you for uh, watching this lecture. So let's go ahead and get started with our course objectives. And so our objectives are, we're gonna distinguish between the label and the labeling. Now, most of you guys already know what that is. Label is what's on the bottle. Labeling is gonna be pretty much anything that the ag extension agent or a university or a community college that can give you about that pesticide itself. It's gonna be pamphlets, it's gonna be printed out labels. It's gonna be pretty much any documentation that the manufacturer is gonna to give to these representatives to give to you, the applicators in the field. Label is what's on the bottle. That's the way I like to keep it. It's everything that's stuck and glued to it. We're gonna understand reg registration differences between federal EPA and special local needs and emergency exemptions. We're gonna find the brand, chemical, and common name on a label, and we're gonna identify active ingredient percentage in pesticide formulations. We're also going to understand the wording that is used on labels and its meaning, whether they be danger poison, danger warning, and caution. And then we're gonna identify what a material safety data sheet is or MSDS sheets. Now, I know that that's something that we need to keep on hand, but you know, the last time I've been pulled by a pesticide applicator, they didn't ask to see an MSDS sheet. They wanted to see the label. They wanted to see um, a good clean copy of it that I keep in a three ring binder, but do we necessarily have to keep it in a three ring binder? You know, most of us have laptops in the uh, trucks now. We have our iPhones, we have our uh, Android phones. A lot of these computers, handheld computers, our cell phones. So we have access to these data uh, such as the MSDS sheets and the labels and any other additional labeling. But I still kind of like that hard notebook copy that I can always give the uh, pesticide applicator when they uh, pull us over. And it's been a while since I've been pulled uh, by an inspector. It's been several years, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, we're also going to understand calibration of equipment. When do we calibrate it? Guys, if you read these text manuals, these textbooks that the Department of Agriculture gives you, you're actually supposed to calibrate your equipment from job to job. Do we do that? Probably not. Guys, we're lucky if we can calibrate our equipment in the mornings um, before we head out to the field. Now, I do highly recommend at least calibrating it once a day and it needs to be the person that's going to use the equipment that is going to calibrate it. We're gonna calculate application area size, we're gonna determine an application rate, and then we're gonna determine the amount of pesticide carrier and concentrate to be used. We're also gonna understand nozzles, speed, and pressure, and how they affect calibration. And those are your objectives for this course. Now, again, label and labeling label information attached or printed on the pesticide container now what usually happens with these labels on the containers guys unfortunately they're going to get damaged they're going to be in the back of a truck they're going to be in the back of a trailer now yes they're supposed to be locked in a container so we're either putting them in our toolbox locking it if we're using a covered trailer they're inside the covered trailer lock or we may have one of these uh, pull behind totes that we're keeping our pesticides in because they are supposed to be locked um, to keep away from the general public, kids jumping up in the back of the truck. I mean, we've seen it, guys. If, the, if it's happened, there's a story that we can find about it. So make sure you keep it locked up, not only for protection and safety, guys, but, man, those things cost money. You don't want somebody just walking up to the back of your truck and stealing a two-and-a-half-gallon uh, jug of Roundup. you got to keep it in the truck. But time to time, guys, getting in and out of the truck, mixing, loading it, whatever, those labels are going to get rubbed raw, they're going to get wet, they're going to get accidentally sprayed or whatever, it's going to happen. That's why I like keeping that printed notebook with the labels and then any other labeling that I may pick up from, um, you know, site one, wherever we're purchasing our chemicals at the time. So 
keep that notebook or keep the iPad, keep a digital copy there. But I don't know. I've never had an inspector say you couldn't have the iPad or have it on a laptop in your truck. So it's good. I think just keep that notebook underneath the truck. So guys, send me a direct message or, or send me a text message. If you've had an issue using an electronic device from a pesticide applicator, do they want to see that printed copy or are they okay with like a tablet or something in your truck? Let me know. Labeling includes the label, all of the printed information referenced on the label and received from the point of sale or manufacturer. Yes. And, you know, you go to trade shows, you know, we got the Green and Grove show that we go to every single year. Um, you're going to be able to pick up copies of labels and other labeling uh, material that are coming directly from these manufacturers. And they may include leaflets and or brochures uh, from the, uh, the manufacturer. And guys, that's why I love going. We go to GIE every year. I always leave with a stack of pamphlets and brochures on the new chemicals that are out because they want me to take it back to the college and use it with our students and kind of show them how to read a label and, and understand um, the information they can pull from a label and the labeling. EPA approval. It takes a minimum of six years to receive EPA approval uh, for a label or labeling. Yeah, so let's say you've come up with this new pesticide. Everybody's worried to death about Roundup, right? What's, what, what's going to replace it? Well, let's say you're that genius that comes up with the idea to replace it. Well, if you figured it out what it is today, it's going to take that EPA six years before they can even approve it. And then it's probably going to take even longer to get it on the shelf before you actually sell it. Um, they're going to have to determine the level of toxicity. How bad uh, is this new chemical towards the environment, to animals, to humans? How, how dangerous can it be? If the pesticide has residual in the environment, so when you actually use it, how long is that residual going to last? Now that can be just as harmful, if not, as a direct application. When it stays in the soil, or it stays on an animal or whatever that can you know, absorb that chemical, it is very, very dangerous. And then environmental hazards or precautionary statements uh, is going to have to be listed uh, from the EPA. And so guys, you know, it's a government thing. It's going to take long. I experience that every single day at the school. It takes forever to get a purchase order approved. You know, you run in your own business, it doesn't take that long. You can actually, if you, if you need to go buy something, you can go and buy it. The government's just going to take a little bit longer than normal businesses do. So got to deal with that EPA, just like we do the IRS, two of our favorite agencies, right? All right, so let's look at this fictitious label, Rondo herbicide. Well, I wonder where it's coming from. It's kind of similar to Roundup, is it not? But this is a fictitious label for educational purposes only. Avoid Rondo contact with foliage, green stems, exposed non-woody roots, or fruit of crops, except Rondo rip crops. Desirable plants and trees beca um, because severe injury or destruction will occur. Now, again, this is glyphosate, so it is 41%. The other inert ingredients um, is 59%, which gives us that 100%. And again, this is a fictitious glyphosate label that we're just going to study here in this, um, in this lecture. Look at the precautionary statements. Uh, it is hazardous to humans and domestic animals, and you need to keep it out of the reach of children. So now, is Roundup really that dangerous? Who knows, guys? Uh, you know, I've sprayed it my entire life. I don't have any side, of, side effects. Uh, you know, I've had some health issues, but I don't think it came from Roundup. So, you know, I am having some blood issues, blood clots. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I would keep using it. It's been a good product for us. And so, uh, you know, if they do get rid of it altogether, I'm going to miss it. Class and registration. This is based on restricted or general use. And I always tell my students at the school, um, you know, restricted use pesticide is something that you've got to have that license to go in and purchase it. You're not going to be able to get it at the big box store. Uh, the general use pesticides you, you can pick up at... Uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot, and it's, it's what the homeowners are going to purchase. And, and homeowners don't need to have access to restricted use pesticides anyway. And a lot of the stuff that we use every day is general use. I mean, Roundup is. You know, some of the other uh, chemicals, you know, pretty much everything that we use is general use. But I'm still buying it at Site One or, um, um, you know, pretty much there or, you know, Southern Ag or whatever we get, you know, get most of our chemicals. 
they're not restricted use. Very seldom do we use a restricted use pesticide in the lawn care and landscape industry. But you still got to keep that stuff separate. You don't even need to have those restricted use pesticides in the big box stores. Keep it at the commercial places that we go and purchase our pesticides because homeowners do not need to have it. Um, but this class registration is based on the application, the loading and mixing, uh, the transportation, the storage, the handling after breaking the seal, uh, and then how equipment is cared for and maintained when using it. And then, of course, the container disposal. All of this takes into effect uh, the class and the registration. And, you know, and this is a pretty serious chemical that this young man here is pouring and mixing because now, actually, how would you like to be in somebody's yard with all of that stuff on and they pull into the driveway? They're going to kick you off the property, right? But this is probably a more dangerous pesticide that he's handling here. This is one of the restricted use pesticides, I'm, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, we just don't use, um, you know, RUPs or restricted use pesticides much in the, uh, the landscape. I'm sure some of you guys have. You probably have a, a larger spray in operation, but to do landscape maintenance, you know, we just don't use them. Um, minimum risk pesticide, uh, is it exempt from the EPA registration? Yes, the minimum risks are. There is no label requirements for it. Uh, however, North Carolina does require that it be registered in the state. Um, I've never really used any, to be honest with you. So, uh, if, if it is, these are, these are the guys that are probably on the, the shelf at Home Depot and Lowe's stuff that we're not going to use anyway, guys. All right. Standard registrations. You as a certified pesticide applicator are responsible for only applying pesticides registered with the EPA. You can get in serious trouble for this. And guys, you're not you're not going to find them anywhere. I've never heard of a story and maybe I've, maybe I haven't really researched it enough, but I haven't heard someone getting in trouble for applying a pesticide that's not registered with the EPA. I mean, pretty much if they're sold in the United States, they, they've got to be right now. I have heard of people purchasing a pesticide in another state and applying it in North Carolina when it doesn't, when it hasn't been registered with the state of North Carolina, but still, um, pretty much everything that I, I know of is registered by this by the EPA so um, I don't know just kind of it's hard to believe that that does happen but I'm sure it does or it wouldn't be in our textbooks for for pesticides now special local needs registrations will allow the states to expand the use of certain pesticides for use for targets not specifically listed on the label so let's say you got an insect that's affecting um, an agricultural crop and you know that the pesticide will take care of this insect, but it's not on the label and you can't find anything else, you can get one of these special local needs um, registrations to actually get that pesticide. And let's look at this, Enlist Duo, um, you know, from Dow AgroSciences, again, just the control of annual perennial weeds and the use on a list, corn, soybeans, and cotton. Used as a non-selective burn down chemical fallow and used as a pre-plant or pre-emergent or post-emergent herbicide on listed crops for control of emerged weeds only. And again, this is a special local needs um, chemical that you can use in a certain situation when you have an infestation of a pest. Emergency exemptions is based on public health emergencies, allows the use of a pesticide for non-registered use. And it's gotta be a major situation. Now, I mean, guys, this is January, 2020. We're hearing of this new flu that's going around starting over in Asia. Well, maybe some of these pesticides can actually take care uh, of that. They could actually release a pesticide if there is a public health emergency to kill that insect or whatever that's causing, I'm sure that's not an insect, but I'm just using that as an example. Uh, when there is a danger uh, to humans, they can have an emergency exemption uh, to use one of these pesticides. And the label, the label, guys, it is the law. The label is a legal document 
uh, with instructions on mixing, applying, storing, and disposing of pesticides. You have to follow the label. Again, it is the law. And guys, we see it so many times. If you're not calculating the correct amount of pesticide to use based on the label, you're in violation of the law and you could be fined for it. Now, is the ag agent going to come up and say, well, how many, you know, how, how many ounces is in that gallon jug right there? Well, the easy, you know, of course, we may get a little less. We may get just a little bit more. So guys, just tell them what the label says. You really need to read this label and know what's in it in case you do get inspected. And you want to know for, for the environment's sake. You're stewards of the land. You don't want to put none of this stuff out. Uh, that you don't have to, you don't want to put more than you need to because guys, that's just costing you money. And what's worth doing for money is, I mean, what's worth doing is worth doing for money. You don't want to apply more pesticide than you need. And it's just as bad if you apply too little of a pesticide. Let's say the, the label requires three to four ounces per gallon in a backpack sprayer. Well, you only put two ounces. You know, it doesn't do the trick. Then you're going to have to go back and then you're going to mix it more likely at that three to four ounce per gallon rate. What have you done there? Well, you've just almost doubled it. If you'd have done it three to four from the first get go, you would have took care of your target pest and not had to go back and do it. It cost you money and it was against the label. So you're in violation of the law and it cost you money. Guys, read the label and do exactly what it says. Now, We've got some good ag agents out there and we've got some good guys at site one and, and the other chemical places. If the label says between two to four ounces per gallon in a backpack sprayer, for instance, and your guy at site one says, well, what are you trying to spray? Well, you're trying to spray a certain weed that's in the yard. He's like, man, I know the label says two to four. Let's go ahead and use four. That's what I'm hearing from our other customers. I don't want you to put two and then have to go back and do it. We're, we're, get, we're seeing good, good kill rates uh, at four ounces. So guys, listen to those guys behind the counter. They know a lot more about the pesticides and what's going on in the field because they see it and hear it every single day. So our trade name or brand name, you know, on the pesticide label, Roundup, that is the brand name. People recognize it. People recognize it as to be something scary. I'm sure that that is a bad name in today's households where it used to be a very popular brand name everybody was using it in their yard well now with everything going on and the lawyers out there they've made this trade name um, scary to a lot of people so the trade or brand name is used in advertisements it's what you're going to see the commercials it's what you're going to see uh, in their print advertisements it's it's the name that you're going to recognize it indicates the formulation and the active ingredients example nomatode 3e indicates three pounds of active ingredient and e means that it is a emulsifiable concentrate this is another fictitious chemical that uh, is used uh, actually on the North Carolina, I think it's the, it's the core manual or the ONT uh, test uh, that, that you actually have to answer some questions on the nomatodes. Don't choose your pesticide based on the trade or brand name because they can be similar to other products. I mean, yeah, there's a ton of glyphosate products out there um, that we can get a lot cheaper than the brand name of Roundup. You know, and since uh, we're spraying it a lot more, we're probably going to use the, um, the less generic formulations or generic names of the glyphosate instead of uh, Roundup. Just to save money, we can save our customers money and, and have a lot more work. We're looking at Rondo herbicide again here. The pesticide type and formulation is listed on the front of the label and contains a short statement. Example, herbicide for control of woody brush and weeds. And that's what Roundup will do. Yes. And we're looking to see that. Uh, we got the EPA registration number here. 333-111-222. That's definitely a fictitious number on it. Um, the pesticide type and formulation. Again, here we have a suspension concentrate. And we see that here, M-Trade, the 350SC is an insecticide. 
It's got the danger word poison on it. A soil applied treatment for the control of grayback and childers, cone grub and sugar cane and silver leaf white fly in various vegetable crops as specified in the directions for use table. Important, read this label and the attached leaflet. So they're giving you that labeling thoroughly before opening or using this product. Now again, guys, an insecticide is probably one of the most dangerous things that we will come in contact with when applying pesticide because it is killing a living animal and we are living animals. And so you know, we could have the same, um, you know, reactions to these insects. Please, please be careful with it. And again, how many times do we have to say, read the label? But I know a lot of guys that are old school, they get the, uh, they get the jug out of the, uh, the truck and they're guesstimating it. They're cutting that Coke can up and say, that's a 16 ounce Coke. The thing says 16 ounces per gallon. They kind of cut the top of it off and they're guesstimating putting in that pesticide into their tanks. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. I'd love to hear some of the horror stories that you guys see every single day. I mean, you know, I'm in Winston-Salem. You guys are across the state. Some of you are in South Carolina and Virginia. So what are some of the horror stories that you're hearing about these competitors that we have and, and what are they getting caught for? Um, I know, you know, we used to get the, uh, the pesticide newsletter every month and stuff that had all these lists. And I think that's going to hundred percent online and I just don't even think to check it, but it would be, it'd be wise to hear, uh, all the, the dumbness that goes on out there when it comes to, to the pesticide guys, for one, the guys that aren't licensed to begin with. And then those are the ones that are really, really messing it up. I know a guy here, uh, close to town that got caught having Roundup in a milk jug and he got caught twice and they, they, they did, uh, they gave him a, you know, a little slap on the wrist to begin with and say, Hey, get your pesticide license. We're going to work with you. You know, they caught him again without having his pesticide license with Roundup in a milk jug and they slapped a hefty fine on him. Um, karate and insecticide here that we're looking at, uh, it is a restricted use pesticide. So we're not going to be able to buy this at Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, or anywhere like that. We're going to have to go to one of the, uh, uh, one of our landscape supply houses to get it. This is an insecticide that is restricted use. So that means it is dangerous. Keep out of the reach of children and it has a warning, uh, sign on it. So bad stuff here. Your ingredient statement, the active ingredient is the chemical in the pesticide formulation that destroys the pest uh, or performs the desired action. So what is it that we are purchasing? It is the chemical. The inert ingredient, not always named, but the label shows the percentage of it. The chemical name identifies the structure of the pesticide and the chemical components in it. Common name is shorter name because chemical name can be very complex and it must be officially accepted by the EPA to appear on the label. All right. Here is your EPA registration number that it must appear on all pesticide labels. And we are looking at an EPA registration number here of 66330-367. And then we have the EPA establishment number, which identifies the facility where the product uh, was produced. And that EPA establishment number for this pesticide is 51036-GA-001. You might ask, why do we have to have the, uh, the establishment number uh, on, the, um, on the label? Well, guys, here, here's the thing. What if... Um, a landscape contractor purchases this pesticide. There is an accident. There's an accident because of, of what happened at the manufacturing plant. They want to be able to trace it back to the plant because they may want to pull that product off the shelf. They want to stop production of it if there is an issue with this chemical. So they always want to know where it is made. And plus, you know, we're buying pesticides all over the country. We're buying them out of out of out of the states i mean some of these chemicals are shipped in so they need to know where it uh, is coming from signal words that we may see 
danger poison, which is the, the, the worst of them all. It's got to have the, the skull and crossbones on it. And then we have danger and then we have warning and then we have caution. And so, like I said, most of the stuff that we're spraying uh, is caution. We may have a warning uh, every so often, but you know, the agricultural guys, the farmers, they're going to be doing a lot more of this danger poison. And guys, you might be doing a lot more different. I mean, some of you guys may have your right of way license. You may have your aquatics and all that stuff. So you may see a lot more uh, different pesticides than we do in the uh, ornamental and turf uh, side of the things. And, and that's pretty much all we will um, ever conduct our business in. Yes, I mean, it would be nice to maybe get aquatics and stuff. But I mean, we're focusing on commercial landscape management and, and residential uh, management services. And so we're just not, we're not seeing, seeing them. All right. Danger poison, uh, has the skull and crossbones. It is highly toxic, uh, when entering the body in either way, whether it's inhalation, whether it's through uh, digestion, or if you get it in your eyes, if you get it on your skin, it is very, very dangerous. And you, you need to be wearing that PPE, the personal protective equipment when, uh, doing things like this. And these guys, uh, you've got to keep locked up. You need to keep them away from your employees that are not even applying the pesticides because a lot of us will have like a corner in our shop where we store our pesticides. You really need to have that pesticide storage facility that is lockable and only a certain few uh, of your crews will have access to these pesticides, guys. You don't want uh, the new guy that you hired yesterday to kind of go in there and, and get a pesticide out because they say, hey, we're going to be spraying weeds on the mowing crew tomorrow. Go over there and get this. And he grabs the wrong thing or he knocks it over or he's walking up to it with a cigarette in his mouth. I mean, guys, it's just common sense. And unfortunately, we have employees that don't have the common sense. Uh, warning. Moderately toxic if entering through the mouth, skin, or inhalation. You can get moderate eye and skin irritation uh, when exposed to it. And there again, you know, karate uh, has the, um, the warning label on it. And it is an insecticide. So it's, it's kind of dangerous, guys. You still don't want to get it in your mouth. You don't want it on your skin. You definitely don't want to breathe it because a lot of the insecticides... Um, affect the central nervous system of these insecticides. A lot of them will kind of move too fast. It's kind of like they, they get overexerted and they literally shake themselves to death. So it's kind of a horrible way to die. And there's, a, I've got a lecture on YouTube that's all about that. Uh, early on in my YouTube days, we talked about that. Like a cetacholine and stuff like that. It affects that. One of the um, when I was at Clemson, we were studying that, and it, it was cool comparing that uh, in the um, anatomy and physiology class that we took and how pesticides affect, uh, affect the humans. It was cool. Caution, slightly toxic uh, if entering through the mouth, skin, or inhalation. Slight eye or skin irritation. And guys, I know everybody tries to be cool. They don't want to have you know, the safety goggles on, they don't want to put the gloves on, they're out there spraying, they put a dip in, they put a cigarette in their mouth, they go to the truck, they, they, you know, they pull the dip out that they've just applied pesticide to, and then they rinse their mouth out and they've got the pesticide on the Coke bottle now. Being cool can get you dead real fast when you're playing around with these pesticides. So guys, please get your, your technicians trained you know, at least send them to the pesticide school, you know, with the Department of Ag. You know, they don't have to have their license, but if they're spraying for me, I definitely want them to get their certification to go through that day and a half pesticide school. And they take the ONT exam and the core exam so that they can be certified because then it kind of comes on to them if they make a mistake and it kind of wakes them up because there's some good examples of guys doing some stupid things and actually getting hurt uh, in these uh, ag classes that they teach. Uh, statement of first aid and treatment in case of contact with the skin do this. In case of contact with the eyes do this. In case of inhalation do this. Always read that and make sure guys you know I always think it's wise that that, that your that your individuals have um, at least CPR and first aid 
um, under their belts. It's, it, you know, it's almost nice to have an EMT on staff, guys, especially if you're on a construction site or whatever, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong there. But at least, you know, get your guys certified in CPR and first aid, and that can save a life. I mean, it, it just doesn't have to do with pesticide. It has to do with the equipment that we run, the vehicular traffic that we're, we're always involved with. You know, I had a guy in my uh, class this past uh, uh, weekend, you know, his, his company, he had two employees involved in a wreck. Uh, one of the guys died on scene. You know, they tried, you know, tried CPR and stuff. I mean, it was just, I mean, unfortunately, it was this young man's time to go. But a lot of times this can, can save people's lives. So, so get your guys certified. Certified in pesticides and CPR and first aid uh, certified. Precautionary statements. Um, these are precautions that need to be followed when using the chemical. Uh, may indicate which entry route the mouth, skin, or inhalation should be especially protected. Guys, your eyes. I don't want to ever lose my eyesight because of something stupid I did with a pesticide. I love seeing my beautiful kids grow up. I love seeing this beautiful world that God's created. I don't want to lose my vision because I didn't wear safety glasses. I mean, I'm always wearing shades anyway, but take the extra precaution if it says use goggles use goggles they're saying it for a reason and here's a example hazards to human and domestic animals extremely hazardous liquid and vapors if inhaled may be fatal if swallowed and it will burn cause burns on, on the exposed skin first aid well here again do not get in the eyes on skin or on the clothing uh, Vican, especially gas fumigate, is odorless. You're not even going to be able to smell it. Exposure to toxic levels may occur without warning or detection by the user. So you're not even going to know that you're breathing it in. First aid, in all cases of exposure, such as nausea, difficulty in breathing, abdominal pain, slowing of movements in speech, numbness in extremities, get medical attention immediately. Take person to a doctor or emergency treatment facility. If inhaled, get person to fresh air immediately. Guys, that, that not being able to breathe is probably one of the scariest things that you're ever gonna experience. I had a heart attack several years ago. Had a blood clot, hit my heart, boom, fell over. Luckily, I was in, still in the Army, uh, and I was on drill weekend, and I was with three other Army medics. I was an Army medic. They knew what was happening. They're the ones that saved my life. But that feeling of something just laying on your chest and not being able to breathe is one of the most scariest things I ever felt because that was an onset of uh, me blacking out. So don't have it happen to you because of a mistake in applying pesticides, guys. So what PPE should I use? You're gonna find that information on the label. PPE or personal protective equipment. And you see the young man here the mustache, that's keeping it out of his mouth, right? Yes. Goes home, he gets a little pesticide on it. He wants to give his wife some sugar. That ain't going to happen. She's going to be like, honey, I smell that. I smell that chemical on you. Just kidding. But he's wearing the goggles. You know, he's got the, the hard hat on. You know, that only helps, uh, you know, helps, you know, keep the sun off you as well. But, you know, you at least need to wear, um, you know, I don't even see him wearing a jacket here. He's only got glasses and the helmet. So again, this is a construction guy. It's a picture I found doing that. But recommendations on what the PPE should be, should be worn to protect the user. And guys, you know, bare minimum. I, I see so many guys applying, even spraying Roundup with shorts and flip-flops. What kind of idiot would do that? You know, wear long pants, wear chemical resistant boots. You know, a lot of these high top boots that we're wearing, they're safe. You know, they can get wet. Your feet don't get wet. But if you got to put booties on, put booties on. But definitely wear long pants. I like wearing long sleeve shirts. You know, we get a lot of our, um, you know, company t-shirts long sleeve because you actually stay cooler with the sun not beating down on you. So protect yourself. Find out what it is on the label that you need to be wearing. Uh, environmental hazards and general environmental statements. Warnings on the label. Uh, to prevent runoff and drift. So many guys call me and they say, hey, Eric, it's uh, 95 degrees today. Can I spray? And they're not even taking into consideration that it's a 15-mile-an-hour wind because we have a big storm coming in. 
that's going to cause drift guys i'm not worried about temperature when the winds are that high physical and chemical hazards you know whether that's flammable or corrosive and you're going to see a symbol like that danger flammable and any pesticide that's flammable i don't really want to mess with directions for use read the label first guys this section specifically details how to use store and dispose of pesticides remember the label is the law storage and disposal probably where all of us aren't doing exactly what we should be doing general instructions for storage and disposable of the chemical in the container you got a triple rinse guys you got to get you got to dispose of it properly it's going to be under the headlines either important note or general instructions and again like i said we need that separate pesticide storage place we need uh, it to be locked we need it to be ventilated we need it to be lit it needs to have power there so we can turn a light switch on or natural light you know surely uh, but you know guys we're going to be getting chemicals out in the mornings we're going to be uh, hitting hard and heavy in the summertime uh, when it's cooler so we're at the shop when it's still dark it needs to be lit and it needs to be only accessible by certain people and you need to have a list of every chemical that's in your storage facility and you need to give one um, you know to your office manager to keep locked up and you also need to let the local fire department know whether they're volunteer or paid they need to know the chemicals that are in your pesticide storage facility because they're the ones going to be fighting the fire and that's the, the last thing you don't want none of those guys injured because they're going into uh, a situation where there's you know explosive pesticides or whatever so let them know name and address of the manufacturer again it's us ag llc looks like that's in uh, luthersville georgia uh, it's got their phone number and it's got their website there on it Here's SureTech. Sure Tech. This is a herbicide enhancer. And net contents. How much product is in the container? Uh, if it's a dry chemical, it's going to be pounds or ounces. If it's wet, it's going to be in gallons, quarts, or pints. And as you hear here uh, on this, Demon EC is an insecticide, an emulsifiable concentrate. There's one pint, and then you look down there at the active ingredients. The active ingredients uh, is 82.5%, and then the other inert ingredients is 17.5%. Uh, so that's, that's a, a fairly high concentrate of uh, the insecticide. So uh, very, very powerful. Uh, each container will state the total amount of product. It is expressed in pounds, ounces, and pints. Like I said here, again, Demon EC is a pint. You need to determine the total active ingredient per container, the use rate of the active ingredient in the container, and then dry formulations will use a percentage of active ingredient. Liquids will use the pound per active ingredient per gallon, which is equivalent uh, on the label. Agricultural use requirements, only pesticides covered by the EPA Worker Protection Standard, or WPS. And this is a, a program that was implemented to protect agricultural workers because, guys, there are a lot of these uh, individuals getting sick. And so they need to be trained before they actually go out into the fields or the greenhouses and do it. If you're running a farm, tree farm or whatever, you've got to have... Um, you know a worker protection standard and you've got to follow those guidelines you've got to have the posters listed your your workers have to be trained in the chemicals that they're using and if not you know you're gonna be paying some hefty fines there guys review this pesticide label here is a restricted use pesticide that is its restricted use designation the trade name is vaporize WP wettable powder um, the formulation is the, the wettable powder. Mode of action, it is an insecticide. Group 10, there's our active ingredients. Vaporin, 12%. Uh, Other ingredients is 88%. You have your net contents, 5 pounds. The registration number from the EPA, 123-4567. EPA establishment number, 123. 
You've got uh, the manufacturer, Agricultural Chemical Company, 1234 Industrial Drive, Logan, Utah. The signal word is caution. We're going to keep it out of the reach of children. First aid, if swallowed, if it's in your eyes, if it's inhaled, and what to do in that. We have our precautionary statements, our directions for use, agricultural use requirements. Use this product only in accordance with its labeling and with the worker protection standard. Do not enter or allow worker entry into the treated areas during the restricted entry level, REI, of 12 hours. So once you apply this pesticide, nobody can enter the treated area for 12 hours. And then storage and disposal. Do not store in or around the home. Keep out of the reach of children and store in a cool, dry place. So it's got to be ventilated. It's actually nice if you, if you could have it uh, uh, conditioned space, if it's in a locked storage one of those little storage little houses that you can get at uh, the Lowe's and Home Depot, have that inside your, uh, uh, your larger area if it's conditioned space. Or if not, you know, get an get a outdoor unit or whatever. Guys, you don't want it to get too hot in the summer. You don't want it to get too cold uh, in the, in the wintertime. So, you know, it definitely needs to be an insulated uh, storage facility. Maybe not conditioned space, but definitely, um, definitely uh, ventilated and insulated. Do not reuse or refill this container. Waste resulting from the use of this product must be disposed of on site or in an approved waste disposal facility. So even though that's, you know, um, a caution chemical, it's uh, still kind of dangerous when you read all these precautionary statements on the label, right? MSDS, material safety data sheet. Manufacturers required to develop an MSDS for each product and provide it upon request. Now, yeah, I remember we used to keep these in the trucks as well, and I don't, I don't know if that's actually, I hate saying this, guys, but I don't know if that's a requirement now that if we need to have it. If I have an MSDS sheet on the chemical, I'm going to keep it with my labeling in my notebook. Um, just have it. It's good information, and you always want to, uh, to know what it says as well. It's going to chemically or the chemical product identification is going to be on it. It's going to tell you your fire and explosion hazards, the physical and chemical properties of the pesticide, the toxicological information and human health data, also the PPE that must be worn or recommended. And guys, I always go beyond what is recommended for PPE. I'm, go I'm going to, I'm going to, to use the, the higher end stuff. I'm going to wear goggles, even though it says safety glasses. I'm going to wear long sleeve. I'm definitely going to wear long pants. I'm going to make sure I'm protected. I want to go home to my family. And then any additional information uh, you'll find on it. So how much? Directions for use. If range stated, use the least possible amount to achieve the goal. And I know I just said this earlier. You know, I was talking about the guys and gals behind the counters. If they're saying two to four ounces per gallon and they're like, hey, Eric, Let's go ahead and use three. That's what we're what we're hearing because this certain weed, it's not getting. The guys are having to go back and spray it again. Use that three ounces, even though it is suggested that we use the lower rate. But these guys behind the counter have more knowledge and they see it every day, hear it every day uh, from from other companies out there, their colleagues, their uh, your competitors, right? But you know we need to help each other out when it comes to that. Recommendations can be provided by the consultants. There are pesticide consultants. That is an actual pesticide license. Industry organizations, um, you know, like Turfgrass Council or whatever. Cooperative Extension, you know, good ag agents that we've got. University specialists, NC State, North Carolina A&T. A lot of the community colleges will, will know this information. And then your pesticide dealers. And like I said, these dealers, I think, are... Uh, uh, a walking encyclopedia of these chemicals, guys, because they're dealing with them every single day. Application rates can be stated on the label in how much per area or how much pesticide per mixture or in a percentage. Adjuvants or chemicals mixed in to improve the effectiveness or safety are often added to the pesticide mixture. Five gallons per acre, five pints active ingredient per acre, five tablespoons per gallon, Half a pound active ingredient per 500 gallons. That ain't, that ain't much, is it? So that's a, that's a high concentrate. And then half a percent by volume or by weight. So guys, 
Um, this is how much we need to put in there and we need to, we need to follow it. We need to measure it. We need to have the devices to measure the correct amount of pesticide going into our, uh, our sites. Mix, load and calibrate. Calibrate your sprayer using only water. Some pesticides, um, are, are ready to use and are applied until they create runoff like aerosols, baits, foggers, dusters, and even collars. So you may not have to, to calibrate those. Other ready to use needs to be loaded in an applicator that requires cal calibration, including most granular, dust, and some in liquid form. Now, our push spreaders that we use on a daily basis will get out of calibration a lot quicker than our sprayers. And so those need to be calibrated daily, guys. If you read the textbooks from the Department of Ag, they're saying calibrated from site to site. But that's going to be hard to do. And when you're calibrating your, your um, push spreader, you need to use the chemical that you're using. You can use like a kitty litter to do it, but you need to be somewhere that you can actually sweep it up uh, and, and actually see it on the pavement. So, you know, parking lot, you know, at your shop, you know, or go to an industrial site or whatever that you got a big concrete area or asphalt area to do it. And if you did it kitty litter, you could probably do it on um, similar turf grass that you're, that you're doing it near. Um, some concentrates don't need to be applied uh, with calibrated equipment. They're just diluted, loaded, and sprayed enough to cover thoroughly or applied to the point of runoff. You know, you're actually spraying it so you can see it drip, you know, if you're spraying an individual shrub or something. Most concentrates have to be diluted and applied with calibrated equipment. Calibration is the process of measuring and adjusting the amount of pesticide your equipment applies or delivers to a specific point. The benefits of calibration include safety, efficiency, and cost savings. Applying more or less than necessary is a waste of money. And guys, if that don't catch your attention, I don't know what else will. Your, your individuals that you hire to spray your lawns, to push the fertilize out, if they're putting more out than needed, you're wasting money. If they put too little out, you're wasting money because you're going to have to go back and do it again. Calibrate your equipment. Well, Eric, we don't have time. We're in such a hurry when we get to the shop in the morning. There's two things that your lawn care technicians need to do. They need to calibrate their equipment daily before they head out to the first job site, and they need to clean the equipment when they come in in the afternoons. Guys, spend that 30 minutes calibrating and cleaning your equipment, and it'll save you money in the long run. I don't understand it. People won't do it. We've been guilty of it, but I'm, I'm a little more stricter with it now. It has to be done and we're going to do it. And it needs to be calibrated by the individual who's going to be using the equipment that day. Calibration rate is affected by travel speed, particle or droplet size, and the pressure or drop mechanism of the application equipment. Again, the travel speed. Well, if you've got Joe working for you who's six foot four, and didn't make the basketball team in college, so he's went through a lawn care program. He's going to be a lot faster than Billy over there, who's 5'7". Their travel speed's going to be different, so they have to calibrate their own equipment. So first thing you're going to do, you're going to make a trial run using water only. Measure how much time it takes to physically cover the area and then measure how much water is sprayed for that amount of time, and then use the measure of water to determine the amount of pesticide to use. Uniform release. Measure the output from each nozzle or hopper available for your equipment to be sure you're releasing the correct amount of pesticide. It shouldn't be more or less than 10%. Method one, operate the equipment at a standstill for X amount of time and measure the output in a container. Method two, Attach containers to each nozzle or hopper and run the equipment over the intended area. Then measure the output in the containers. Guys, this should be repeat for you. You should be doing this every single day if you're a lawn care company. Test application. Do an accurate measurement of the amount in the tank. Operate the equipment over the intended area at a constant speed. And then measure the amount needed to refill the tank back to the pre-application level. 
Figure your application rate. That is the amount dispersed divided by the distance covered is your application rate. Simple enough, guys. With small sites and small equipment, if applying the pesticide in small quantities, you can scale down and test using small amounts. If you're using a larger site with larger equipment, you're gonna have to uh, uh, use a larger site to calibrate and a larger amount of chemical or water to do your calibration. Now, here is some uh, pictures. This is from the National Corps uh, Manual. You know, calculating rate, guys, I'm not gonna go over this. You know how to do it. If you're having issues with it, kind of study it. You know, areas is length times width. If we're doing it for triangles, it's, uh, you know, the base times height divided by two or length times base divided by, you know, the old geometry style. But here they've got base times height divided by two. The area of a circle, pi r squared. Um, you know, pi is a constant, 3.14, and then you got to find your radius, which is half the diameter, and you square it. And then here's calculating the application rate. You determine from a calibration test that your boom sprayer delivered 10 gallons of water over one quarter acre test area. You need to apply a pesticide product to a 10 acre field, 43,000 square feet. 43,560 is the acre. Pesticide label recommends that four ounces of liquid product be applied or be added to a given desired finished spray mixture of one gallon. And there are 128 fluid ounces in one gallon. How much spray volume and how much product is needed? How much spray mixture is needed for the 10 acre application area? Always use information from the calibration test. In this example, 10 gallons of water was used over a quarter acre calibration test area. So 10 gallons divided by the quarter acre is equivalent to Y gallons divided by acres. Cross multiplication. And guys, we're gonna get 400 gallons of spray mixture needed. Step two, how much pesticide product is needed to make up 400 gallons of spray mixture? Use the label rate of four ounces of product per one gallon of spray. 400 gallon spray mixture times four ounces of liquid pesticide product, 1,600 ounces of product needed. How many gallons of product are needed? Remember 128 ounces in a gallon, 16 ounces of product divided by 128 ounces is 12 and a half gallons of product. Final result, to treat 10 acres, you need a total final spray mix of 400 gallons that includes 12.5 gallons of the concentrated product. Good example of calculating your application rate, guys. Now, you need to check for misapplication. Keep an eye open on the amount that you're actually applying for the load you calculated. If something is off, stop and check your calculation and your equipment, and you can catch and correct any errors before it is too late. And you need to kind of be out there with your, your guys calibrating your equipment in the morning. Now, let's kind of talk a little bit about beer and comparing it to barricade. How much would an application of Barricade 65 water dispersible granulars cost for an 8,000 square foot home loan if the labeled rate is one pound active ingredient per acre and Barricade 65 WDG is $39.95 per pound? How much would an application of granular combination product cost for the same loan at the same rate? Guys, typical problems that we're going to see every single day in the lawn care. We're putting out barricade in the, in the springtime. We're getting ready to do that, right? Uh, when, dry formulate, when, when using dry formulations, the number on the label refers to the percent active ingredient by weight. Example, the barricade 65 water dispersal granule is 65% by weight, prodiamine, active ingredient. Therefore, 100 pounds of barricade 65 WDG contains 65 pounds of prodiamine, and one pound of barricade 65 WG contains 0.65 pounds of prodiamine. Prodiamine. I always say it that way. I know I'm probably saying it a little different than you guys, but I'm a country boy. When using liquid formulations, the number on the label refers to active ingredient per gallon of product. Example, Barricade 4FL has four pounds of prodiamine active ingredient per one gallon of product. Therefore, if you have a two and a half gallon jug of Barricade 4FL, you have 10 pounds of prodiamine and four pounds active ingredient per gallon times 0.25 gallons is 10 pounds active ingredient. 
So how do we incorporate this information into sprayer spreader cost analysis or calculations through dimensional analysis? And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Reynolds for, for examples of this. I learned a lot from him. He's a, uh, I uh, was at NC State, now he's down at Texas A&M. Good man, smart man when it comes to uh, pesticides. So you've got to start with what you have to get to what you want. So how much would five truckloads of beer cost when delivered to a convenience store? Let's say, well, delivered to turf teacher's shop. If there are 1,000 20 ounce beers per truck and they cost five cents an ounce. Well, let's look at it. We have truckloads, we want to figure out the cost. Beginning with the unit that you have, proceed to the unit you want by canceling out these units through multiplication. So we have five truckloads of beer. There's a thousand beers on a truckload. We have 20 ounces per beer, and then it's a nickel per ounce. And I'm thinking I can actually use uh, a little pin here. So I'm going to try this, guys. Yep, there's a pin. So look, we're going to cross. Ah, as you can see, I was going to try to do it myself, but I've got it on the next slide anyway. So we're going to cross out truckloads. We're going to cross out drinks. You know, just kind of do it right here. Cross out the truckloads, boom. Cross out the drinks, boom. Cross out the ounces, and we're left with dollar sign. So the five truckloads times a thousand times 20 times a nickel, we have $5,000 worth of beer delivered to our shop. That's a good Friday afternoon for the boys working hard, right? So how much would an application of Barricade 65 water dispersible granulars cost for an 8,000 square foot home loan if the labeled rate is one pound active ingredient per acre and Barricade 65 WDG is $39.95 per pound. Start with what you have to get with what you want. What we do have is an 8,000 square foot lawn and we want to figure out the cost. 8,000 square foot lawn, one acre over 43,560 square feet. One pound active ingredient per acre, one pound of Barricade over pounds per active ingredient. We have the cost per pound of Barricade. It gives us 319,600 divided by the 28,314. So it costs $11.28. Therefore, an 8,000 square foot lawn, the total product cost for this application of Barricade 65 WDG is $11.28. Now, what do you think that this right here can help us figure. Guys, if we know the exact square footage of all our lawns out there, let's say, let's say we're cutting, a th you know, we have a thousand lawns that we're applying pesticides to, and we know the exact square footage of each lawn, we can come up with a total square footage of turf grass that we're maintaining this year. We can figure out our exact cost of product for the entire year. And what can you do with that early on in December when our dealers are offering us prepay? Go ahead and order your chemicals for the next year and you get a big percentage off. You can save a lot of money. Your cost comes down even further. Well, Eric, I don't have the money to pay for that. Well, what if you're pre-billing some of your clients? Not, not all of them are gonna do it, but let's say you have enough that you can buy this product in advance at that discounted rate and you can save a ton of money doing that. So good information there um, that I like talking about. And again, thanks to Dr. Reynolds for the information on dimensional analysis. I've sat through a bunch of his classes, learned a lot for him, so I wanted to pass that on to you. And so guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, for uh, joining this class, pesticide uh, or label calculations. Guys, my name's Eric Jones, better known as Turf Teacher. I'll see you in the next lecture.